thought I told all of you I want radio silence until further... Oh, I'm very sorry, Hans. I didn't get that message. Maybe you should have put it on a bulletin board. Mr. Mystery Guest. Do you really think you have a chance against us, Mr. Cowboy? yippee ki mother... <laughs> to another episode of Film Asylum. We are your hosts, Colin Peters here. yippee Kaye, motherfucker. John Rochetter here. <laughs> and Jeff Manfred. <laughs> <laughs> Had to do that. We couldn't wait till the end. We're just literally just going to dive right in. We're going to go right into this one. <laughs> we got to go all in. I mean, we are going to be talking about one of the best action movies ever of all time. What are you Die. talking about? It is the best fucking Christmas movie out there. Fucking fight me on that one. <laughs> Not just an action movie, but a Christmas movie, and we're going to debate that. Well, that yeah, we got a strong debate on whether or not this is actually considered a Christmas movie or not. I don't know how long this debate has been going on for, but it's kind of ongoing, and there's never been a resolution, but we are going to get to the bottom of that today. Probably about 30, 31 years. <laughs> 31 years. Oh, I so. thought it was recent because of social media. Nah, just everyone debated it for a while. So. Oh, okay. Well, I guess we'll have to get into that more. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I know. I just always enjoyed the movie Absolutely. and I didn't care. I can watch it any time of the year. Doesn't matter what part. You can, you can, beginning, middle, doesn't matter. You can just throw it on at other part and just be immersed in the whole experience yeah you know easter birthday human sacrifices any time of the year man for anything (laughs) (laughs) get things started die hard directed by john mctiernan yeah and this was actually originally a book actually a sequel to a Another story called The Detective that came out as a movie back in 1968. It starred none other than Frank Sinatra. Really? Yeah. It was written by the same guy. I believe his name was Roderick Thorpe. The novel was called The Detective as well as the movie. And Frank Sinatra actually really enjoyed doing The Detective so much that he clamored uh, Roderick Thorpe to do a sequel. And Thorpe wasn't too crazy about it. He went on for years trying to come up with an idea he didn't want to repeat the same thing but then he eventually did create a book called nothing lasts forever i'm glad they changed the name to die hard for the movie yeah (laughs) i can't imagine that being a top selling action movie nothing lasts forever sounds like a bond film actually it does does. sound like a bond film (laughs) and nothing lasts forever was also different in itself because i don't believe the detective's name was actually john mcclain and the original book like okay. in the detective and in uh, nothing lasts forever i forget what the name of the sinatra character was but in nothing lasts forever the mclean character he's actually in his 60s i believe and instead of seeing his estranged wife he's actually in a building to see his daughter and this book was inspired by i believe it was the movie the towering inferno from what i had seen and heard okay which was another tower you know action kind of movie <laughs> i never saw it you so. gotta put a tower in there <laughs> 30 or more floors but we mentioned yeah john mctiernan directed this movie this was um right off of the success of predator yes yeah it was very successful in 1987 and predator would have not been the film if it had been for john mctiernan's direction because that movie was going in all sorts of wrong especially with the original concept of what the predator was and he even said he even returned the suit back to the studio and said, you really don't want us to continue with this, do you? <laughs> Everyone looked at the suit. It was like this ugly turtle reptile. With and then they're like, no, wait, no, wait, no, wait, stop, stop, stop. No, 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 we're not doing this. And then they started going to basically ground zero with the concepts of the Predator. And then they started to get something going with the mandibles and then the creature effects. Created and by Stan Winston and James Cameron. Yes, yes. They had a collaboration, and that was really, really awesome. I know John McTiernan directed, like, 95% of the movie Predator. He didn't direct the big shootout with the um, the, uh, the hostage scene with the helicopters and all, like, all the huge gunfights. He didn't actually direct those. I think the other uh, second AD came in to do that because it was a lot of, like, 
cuts back and forth, and that's not what he wanted to do. They couldn't really come up with a, a game plan how they wanted to film it. So he didn't actually film those she those scenes with the big shootouts with all the bodies flying and the explosions, but he still helmed 95, 98% of that movie. And because of his steadfast hand as a director, that's why that movie was so successful because there was so much energy to it. And then he makes Die Hard, which is the quintessential action movie. I mean, there have been a slew of imitators ever since Die Hard came out in 88 movies, action movies going forward. There have been, like I said, a number of movies that have sort of copied the template. I mean, look at movies like Under Siege, Air Force One, The Rock, even more recent ones like Olympus Has Fallen and the recent Dwayne The Rock Johnson film, Skyscraper, woof. <laughs> they all borrowed from the same template. They all involve around a group of terrorists occupying an area, controlling hostages. There's one or two people that it's up to to save the day. And then they just take out the terrorists one by one, and then that's it. <laughs> really, I mean, it's set, like like we talked about and before other episodes of Halloween, how Halloween set the template for horror and slasher movies going forward. Die Hard set the template for action movies going forward at that moment. It did, and it also broke the mold of typical action movies because before it was macho guys, six pack abs, <laughs> huge <baby> chest, oil. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the get to the chopper, uh, and the I'm your worst nightmare, you know, all these oh, corny yeah. lines. But Die Hard and throughout this movie, and I think what really helps it is the humor that's in it. Yeah, a lot of dry humor. And dude, like the scene where the dude's stealing a candy bar while the cops rolling up. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the two Johnson yeah. cops, two Agent Johnson. Johnson and Johnson, not related. Yeah. <laughs> I think the more recent one that I was laughing about was the guy that was doing coke asks the terrorist for a coke, and they bring him out a Coca Cola, not the drug. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They walk in on Ellis, like, what were you doing back there, Ellis? Oh, nothing, just going over some mm, documents. <laughs> we can remember his name, too. That's what made even funnier. <laughs> or the, when Bruce Willis would, like, like circle around a building to try to escape the terrorists or the thieves, because technically they're really thieves, they're really even though thieves. They're called, they call them terrorists. Exactly. He sees a, a picture of a Playboy posted on the wall. He slaps the hand on it. He, he sees it once as he walks by, and he's like, oh, hey, check that out. And then as he, like, circles around, he doesn't realize where he is, and he sees it, and he's like, oh, hey, baby, again. <laughs> it's like they have all these moments that kind of break away from the tension where it's not all, oh, my God, what's going to happen? And like, oh, damn, dude. Uh, no. And that's what makes it great. And it's sprinkled throughout the whole movie. Yeah. Even at times where you think... They shouldn't be la like, should we be laughing here? Because it's so ratcheted up that we're like, oh, d you know, got to save the day, got to get the hostages out. And we're, we break out laughing. Yeah. It, it's like, that's great. That's clever. It really is. I know there, there are some humor moments that really fall flat for me. And I think it all revolves around Deputy Chief of Police Dwayne T. Robinson. Some of his humor is bad. When the roof explodes... The helicopter's crashing. It blows up. He just looks at everyone and goes, holy Christ. We're going to need some more FBI guys, I guess. Like, dude, really? I don't Are you intentionally trying to tell a joke or is this by pure accident, man? I'm, I'm sorry. The writing for him was pretty bad. I'm like, why are you here? Get out of here. You're like, like slowly hurting this movie a little bit. When he was the hard ass, he was fine. It was when he was trying to like bring in inject some comedy it really didn't fit they're so like, going after the lights i'm like oh my god you dumbass he, he did have one good one though what was that when you get the body falling out of the building and he goes boy i hope that's not a hostage i'll give him that yeah that was good the other ones are bad though <laughs> we're gonna need some more fbi guys i guess oh my god well, like three people just died man are you kidding me well there were two writers to the movie as well okay because they knew that they couldn't do the book the way the book was structured and funny thing is, Frank Sinatra was actually contractually obligated to do uh, Die Hard, or well, Nothing Lasts Forever. So essentially, Die Hard is a sequel. Die Hard is technically a sequel, How yes. About that? When they looked over Nothing Lasts Forever, they saw that there was a structure there, but they didn't think it had to be that book. Okay. So what they did was they hired a writer, said, take the skeleton of what the structure of this is, and flesh it out from there. And the writer, 
I believe it was Jeb Stewart. There were two writers, Jeb Stewart, and Stephen E. DeSouza, D'Souza. D'Souza. And he was brought in to create more humor in the movie. Okay. Jeb Stewart fleshed it out. Gotcha. And even he was kind of at a loss. He said he didn't really know what to do with the movie. And how the idea came about was he had a fight with his wife. He got in a car, took off, and he saw a refrigerator box on the highway, couldn't maneuver or get away with it, and he mm-hmm. thought, well, it looks like I'm going to run into it, and more than likely I'm going to die. Here the refrigerator box was empty. There was nothing inside it. And here he realized, boy, I just dodged a bullet there, and he figured he had to go back and apologize to his wife. Wow. And he said instead of a 40-year-old guy going to see his daughter, uh, no, daughter's 40, I'm sorry, and the dad is 60. He said it's a 30-year-old guy going to see his wife and they have a fight. Yeah. And Christmas was the catalyst that brought them together. Okay. Yeah, and like the first 10 minutes of this movie, you really learn a lot about these characters. And not a lot of directors and films are good at accomplishing that. You already get the idea that he hates to fly. He's gripping his seat, and then there's the passenger next to him who's trying to give him the tips. Hey, you want to know the survival to air travel? Take off your shoes and your socks and make fists with your toes. <laughs> and then you learn that he's been a cop for 11 years. Um, every flight attendant that's a woman wants to eye fuck the shit out of Bruce Willis. Well, it's Bruce Willis in the 80s. Come on. <laughs> Holding a teddy bear. <laughs> yeah. What are you expecting? Even Bruce Willis now. That bald head, man. He's rocking that bald head. I mean, he did it in uh, Die Hard 4.0, which I thought was a better title than Live Free or Die Hard. That was the European title, Die Hard 4.0, which I thought it should have been. He's rocking the bald head in that movie. He was awesome in that one. I mean, you could uh, Bruce Willis can put a mullet on and girls still want to jump him. I mean, come on. He's, he's a German born in March. Just saying. It's more German than Hans Gruber. <laughs> <laughs> Germans are cool. Yeah. And then, and then continuation, you have the party at the Nakatomi Plaza, and you realize that their marriage is on the rock. She's calling the housekeeper and her children, like, has the room been made up? And he's not here. And, like, and she just slams the picture down with the family portrait of, uh, not the family portrait, but the photo of John McClane, Holly Gennaro, and then the two children. She just slams it closed. I'm like, oh, their marriage isn't doing so well. Maybe that's why he's here. It's, 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 really, it's really good storytelling. It's all visual storytelling, and it, it really, a lot of films aren't good at capturing that much character development in just the first 10 minutes of the movie. Not even 10 minutes. The pacing with the movie is really good. It's solid. It, it's, not, it's not like it drags. It's, it's really more of a movie that it is something that you got to see, and, and if you tell, or maybe even a pitch, too, because John McTiernan said he turned this movie down at he least did. three times. Well, I think it was mainly due to the terrorist thing in there he said he didn't like terrorists either it okay. was his idea to make them bank robbers or or thieves because he mm-hmm. said that they're more fun criminal yeah. masterminds with a lot of suave and mm-hmm. sharp dressed men most of them <laughs> and speaking of bruce willis he wasn't taken seriously for the part of john mcclain number five in line you had schwarzenegger stallone burt reynolds and Richard Gere, of all people. You forgot about Clint Eastwood. He was the one after Frank Sinatra. Was he really? Yeah, he didn't... When they handed him the script, he didn't get the jokes. Oh, so he turned okay. it down. And I'm like, could I really imagine Dirty Harry as John McClane? Because even at the time, like, he's a badass. He's yeah. He's fucking Clint Eastwood. I don't give a fuck. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. But Bruce Willis, like, fits this. I'm like, I'm just thinking about all the other ones, like, Arnold Schwarzenegger, I don't think he could fit through the fucking vent. Hell, even through the front door. Oh, I know. <laughs> They'd have to, like, rewrite some scenes or, like, include a couple more jokes in there how he can't fit his big muscles yeah. in the vents. <laughs> Hell, he could probably just overpower all the terrorists <laughs> just with his hands. Yeah, right. They would have to have a couple scenes here where he rips a guy's heart out with his hands or something. Oh, yeah, that probably would be thrown in there. It would be an action movie that would not be taken as seriously. Plus, they'd have to change the ethnicity of the terrorist he's, uh, he's Austrian going up against <laughs> German <laughs> I'm one of you <laughs> no now I actually kill you <laughs> now I kill essentially, you essentially he would become the predator in this movie <laughs> <laughs> I will hunt you <laughs> and then this one has a chopper too <laughs> it's up on the roof get to the chopper oh no it blew up <laughs> you mean I have to walk on glass with my bare feet I crush the glass. I crush the man. I crush the glass. <laughs> I crush you. 
Yeah. Oh, it, man. The typical 80s guys were chosen for this, but... That's why this movie's so special, because it breaks that mold of that cliched action movie. This isn't Commando that we're watching. This is this is Die Hard. And that was another thing. They thought that they could have made Commando 2 out of this story. Really? There, well, there was talk about how they were going to take the John Matrix character and and put this in here. Oh, my God. That was a little rumor I had seen, okay. but... Of course, nothing with that came to fruition with it. I still have a sour taste in my mouth, the fact that Richard Gere was considered... It's awkward. It's very awkward casting. I didn't think that would work at all if he was chosen. I wonder if it was because it was the 80s and it was Richard Gere, he was... But had he ever done an action movie before this? I don't think he's ever done one. How would this work? Actually, (laughs) didn't didn't he do one with Bruce Willis in the 90s called The Jackal? Oh, was that him? That was him. All I remember is a scene with Bruce Willis shooting that dude's arm off. Jack Black's arm. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, hold that cigarette out. <laughs> and his multiple disguises, he was like in like 10 different outfits with different wigs and different hairstyles. Well, wigs. <laughs> but different facial hair patterns on his face. I'm, I don't know. Just for, just, so, for, we're, as we're talking, I'm realizing Bruce Willis went from like romantic comedy TV to iconic action star. And that's all I can remember him as. I yeah. totally forgot about... You know, the two crappy movies before Die Hard. The couple <laughs> crappy movies sprinkled throughout. I just remember all the action movies throughout. I'm like, dude, he's in everything. Yeah. He, be, he became the one of the top three action movie guys of our generation. Yeah. Even look at Expendables. Yeah. He was in there, and he was probably the funniest one going back and forth with Arnold. I mean, he was an everyman. He didn't look like Arnold Schwarzenegger or Stallone. He was just like an every... He was more relatable. That's why yeah. this movie helps. But, but he had such a big presence that it made the movie even better. But when I see him, I still looked at him as a heroic figure. He still looked like a guy that was athletic. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, like, he didn't have the killer six-pack abs no. and the super-cut body. But he did look like somebody who stayed in shape. And he's right. Bruce Willis is a big guy. Maybe so it was believable that he could take a punch and throw one back if he had to. Did he know kung fu or martial arts? No, but no. he found a way to get an edge over his opponent. Whether it was, you know, beating you with a fire extinguisher with his bare fists. I mean, he was going to get an edge over you. <laughs> Enough of this kung fu shit. <laughs> and just and, tackle you to the pavement and, and in, punch you to a pulp. And in fact, he wasn't really trying to be the hero in the movie at all. No, he, he was sure. kind of like a like bad situation kind of thing. Yeah. Unfortunately, he was the only one that the Nakatomi hostages had left in this situation. He was there to save his marriage, not fight terrorists. Not thwart a mastermind's plan of stealing 64, what was it? Million or billion? 640 million dollars in negotiable bearer bonds. I mean, that's what he was out for. He wasn't here to stop him. He was here to save his marriage. Bruce fucking Willis. Bruce fucking Willis, man. Bruce motherfucking Willis, man. (laughs) I think yeah, watch Die Hard later. <laughs> I probably will. I probably will again too. Yeah, he's not invincible. The guy, he can get his teeth kicked in. He can get shot at and beat up and cut on his feet with glass, and he'll still come out on top. And what makes it funny is the fact that he was doing this movie and Moonlighting at the same time. That's why they had to cut his stuff down and made everyone else's parts bigger because okay. he was doing double time. I had read a rumor that he looked like he wasn't going to be feasible for him to do the movie because of doing moonlighting yeah. but because civil shepherd got pregnant they said they were going to take 11 weeks off and they were like oh perfect we can get bruce willis for that then <laughs> pumped him out in 11 <laughs> weeks <laughs> and yeah. uh interesting trivia the first shot that bruce willis did was the shot of him jumping off the building and they said that was really him that did it and you get that iconic shot of him with the explosion going off so that's brilliant i love when an actor or an action star, whichever, they are not afraid to throw themselves into the stunt. Oh, yeah. When you have an issue, when you have an actor that doesn't want to do their own fight choreography or their own stunts, I know Bruce Willis, the one he didn't do was him going from one event shaft to the other. That was somebody else. But him on top of the elevator going up, yeah. that was him doing that stunt. It mm-hmm. looked so sleek. The camera was locked down. You just see him sweating and then as it's going up and up and up it's just it, it's, it's ratcheting up the tension really well but when you have an actor that doesn't want to do that it creates a strain on the director where they have to incorporate more cuts than they wanted to do and try to mask stunt work it looks awkward when you have an actor that doesn't want to do that there are physical actors like bruce willis harrison ford keanu reeves that are willing to throw themselves into the stunt to sell it tom cruise even mm-hmm. too 
all those guys want to throw themselves into the experience so they can give the audience the best experience. Say whatever you want about Tom Cruise, but the man is not afraid to go balls out to give the audience the best viewing experience possible. Look at all the Mission Impossible movies. He's not afraid to do it. I'll say this about Tom Cruise. <clears throat> Fuck him. <laughs> I'm not talking about Scientology. I'm just talking about him as an action star. Say whatever you want about his beliefs. Believe oh, yeah. Fuck Scientology, have. too. <laughs> I'm just going to piss everybody off, yeah. aren't we? That's another thing. We're missing... I feel like we're missing the go-to action star and action franchise of this era of today. What do we have? We have Gerard Butler in the Fallen franchise, which is now becoming a thing. Ooh, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah exactly. Yay. Yeah. Now, 2015 with Mad Max Fury Road, Tom Hardy... I thought we were going to start to get something going because that was a good like rejuvenation of Mad Max and Tom Hardy at the helm. And it's been four years since we got a movie yeah. in 2015. Like He could have easily been like the next big action star with Mad Max. I thought they were going to go in that direction, but then it's because there are a lot of production woes and controversy after the film ended, and it's kind of been put a stamper on the whole thing. I think it's because we've been overtaken by the comic book craze and... That that's too. that. That's loaded with a lot of action, and they're creating yeah. actors through that. But See, not even just through the comic book phase. If they're rebooting and remaking everything, so there's nothing original to come up with, this like a true. new action star. Like yeah. as you said, the Fallen franchise is literally Die Hard, but for the new era. It is Die Hard. The first one, Olympus Has Fallen, is definitely Die Hard. And so it's like if we don't have anything original. What are we gonna put out there, like? Dude, yeah. even every genre is like that right now. How many remakes in horror do we have right now that are coming out? I can think of at least four. And one of them being this Friday. Don't like remind Christmas. me of that one. Oh, God, that looks like a, a cluster fuck. You know what I'm going to do? I'm still going to watch it. I'm never going to watch it. I can't help that. myself. I've got problems. <laughs> I've got problems. <laughs> I've got problems. <laughs> are you crazy? Yes. A little bit. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like we grew up with like. Sean Connery's James Bond. We grew up with, like, Lethal Weapons, Martin Riggs, and John Carpenter's Snake Plissken. We grew up with all these big action stars, and now we've got nothing to show for. Hollywood doesn't want to groom too many newer guys. They already, they're kind of retracting, like we said, that they wanted Arnold. They wanted Stallone, Clint Eastwood, guys that they thought could, like, really break out. I'd say that's why we're on, like, what, Rocky Eight and... Uh, Rambo Seven. Rambo Seven. Yeah, oh, I forgot about Rambo. We're on yeah. Die Hard Six. We're I'm wait. We're <laughs> on Terminator Twenty Seven. Terminator or Dark Fate. Yeah. yeah. I was the, like the, the third reboot. Or I was like <laughs> even even going back to Bruce Willis. Like with him redoing Death Wish, it put him back into the spotlight of the action movies. But yet he was still playing the older guy who was kicking ass. I was yeah. like, I just thought of this. Keanu Reeves is the only action star that's still doing I action movies. I forgot about that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's like the best new original one is the yeah. John Wick franchise. We're getting that and fucking fan, not Fantastic Four. Uh, <laughs> Matrix 4. <laughs> at the same Four. time. Yeah. At the same time. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of reboots, remakes, and soft reboots, soft remakes. I mean, yeah, it's, it's all over. I like it when they take an actor that we don't know and they create him and bring him in to an action world like christian bale he wasn't really known for being an action guy until he did batman no he was like a period piece actor like in little women a midsummer night's dream <laughs> he did do yeah. a movie called equilibrium that was kind of that was awesome it, that was yeah that was pretty cool and he fit the bill in that mm -hmm. but it was really close to the book of uh, the fahrenheit 451 like yeah very similarity so oh yeah same kind of totalitarian existence and futuristic world it was really cool though with the the martial arts and the gun sequences that was awesome but he's also an actor is the the thing you know mm -hmm. it's not just he's not just stuck in one specific genre like you can believe he can kick somebody's ass he can go and do drama or do comedy like i feel like keanu reeves is that same kind of guy i know people like making fun of him now they kind of leaned off of it because now that they they've seen john how wick. badass john wick is like, okay you win. We're, we're, we're done making fun of your accent and your, and your yeah, acting in like, the past. We're, like we're the, done with that. The three of us have recognized it, but other people I don't, had just felt the need to pick on them. And, like, I know. We've recognized it from the 80s because of Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. I don't care who the fuck says it's a bad movie. It's amazing. That's why we're getting a third next year. It is an amazing movie. <laughs> it's an amazing movie. It's an amazing franchise, and I'm, I'm, I'm excited for the third one. I really am. And then when uh, 
it's when John McClane arrives at the Nagatome Plaza, you get this sort of culture shock where he's from the east and then everybody here in this building is from the west. You know, you he, he, you get like a culture shock vibe because he's going around. He's not really fitting in with these stuffed shirts and these people that are like celebrating Christmas because they just had a huge deal come through. The one dude comes up and kisses him and he's like, what? What? The, come <laughs> on. Like, I'm not used to this. What is this? Is this an L.A. thing? What's going on here? He takes a drink from the tray. Like, oh, that was awful. Let me put that down. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, fu we'll fuck that. We put that down. And then, you know, they have, like, a limousine. He rolls up in a limousine. He's not used to this kind of luxury. He sits in the front yeah, seat. I know. <laughs> this is a good culture clash of, like, two different sides of the world and then the United States. And it's really awesome. And they have this little toy where you can, like, put in someone's name and you can look up what floor they are in this building. And that's another good character development where he looks up his wife, Holly McClain, but she's going by Gennaro. And he's upset. he's upset by that. Uh, great. This is another step down in our marriage. I'm I'm not really looking forward to this conversation going forward. But saying, this is still in the beginning of the movie. This like, is all the beginning. So it's like developing the characters that are, we haven't even seen yet. Mm -hmm. So it's like showing like, oh yeah, there was shit happening for a while. Even when he's talking to Argyle about uh, what's happening, why he's there. I was like, it's more all through the dialogue. It's building up like, oh shit, like there's more going on than what they've already shown. Yeah. And uh, that's why this would be like one of the best movies to ever watch other than you know being diehard but <laughs> <laughs> it's it is a great movie for um film aspiring it people. is it, how to do it right how to yeah. do action movies right because you don't get that really fast motiony looking look like they use in action movies now it's like a, almost a steady cam like it wasn't really it's like sleek shaky, was yeah. it? it's sleek it's locked down when it needs to be locked down you don't it's use awesome. that shutter effect and uh they do some good cutaways. It's basic action. It's like macho guys just duking it out, mm -hmm. which is, it's like step above bar fight, but it's... Because <laughs> <laughs> there's it, no fight but, choreography in but bar it's, fights. But it's badass. <laughs> like, oh, if you man. ever notice, like, there's that one scene where we'll get to Hans Gruber, Alan Rickman's character, where they first meet. They have these Dutch angles, and a Dutch angle usually lets you know that something's not right here mm -hmm. so like the the angle's all crooked and you're going like why is it because it's uneasy alan rickman plays hans gruber who is the terrorist who comes into the play and he wants to rob the nakatomi building and at one point they find out that bruce willis has the walkie talkies and he's messing with hans and they're getting frustrated now and he sent han sends out his guys to go after bruce willis but he thwarts them all yeah and they find out that he has the detonator so alan rickman takes some matters into his own hands and he bumps in the bruce willis at one point they've never scene. seen each other yet and they only know each other by voice right so, uh hans puts on an american accent to fit to disguise himself and it's like funny seeing this whole interaction happen because up to this point they're only through radio where uh, john mcclane is fucking with them and then all of a sudden, it's like he just randomly strolls into Hans, and it's like he has this really bad American accent. I was laughing about it because it's like like a, that's what makes it brilliant, though. Yeah. But it, like he's really like, trying. Yeah. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, I guess the what actually sets Bruce Bruce Willis, I keep calling that John McClane off, is the way he hands him the cigarettes and the way he's smoking is what a European style was at the time, and that's what actually clues John McClane in that it's not mm -hmm. an American person. I didn't pick mm -hmm. up on that. Okay. I was like, and then like, that's why when he hands him a gun, it's empty. Yeah. <laughs> I did but not pick up on that. The funny thing is about that scene, that's Alan Rickman's first scene that he shot and he ended up hurting his leg when he jumped down. So throughout the rest of the movie, he's either sitting or he's staying on one leg to like shoot. And I'm like, I never even took notice of that. Like, if that was the first shot, like, everything prior to it, you're like, oh, he's sitting at the desk. God, yeah. <laughs> but when he shot a, what's his name, Takagi, Takagi. Who, who runs the Nakatomi building. I think they had cut him off at the waist with the table, didn't they? Yeah, they did that. And then when he goes out and announces that uh, Mr. Takagi will not be with us for the rest of his life. He's sitting, <laughs> he's, he's he's sitting, sitting on down, the edge. Eating. Yeah. Oh. He's really eccentric. Because like, him, like, whistling or humming in the elevator. Saying, then, oh, uh, like, John Phillips, your suit. I have, <laughs> I have two, two of my own. Yeah. Like, he really is eccentric. And that's, this is probably my favorite Alan Rickman role that he's ever done. It was his For, first movie role. It was his first movie. Forget Professor Snape. It, it's, it, it's Hans Gruber. 
And it brings a tear to my eye because, because unfortunately Alan Rickman is no longer with us, but he's such a talented actor. This was his first film role of all time. Uh, he got the part because John McTiernan watched some production of uh, Dangerous Liaisons yeah. and knew that he would be right for the role of Hans Gruber. I think the only problem they had with Alan Rickman, you could tell he never used a gun, like didn't even hold one because he really held it limply. And then like they had to cut away every time he pulled the trigger because he would flinch. Okay. Yeah. I was laughing about that, like finding this stuff out. Like it's cool. Like as much as we watch the movie, like you don't know about the cool stuff behind. Like that actually caught me off guard. I'm like, I didn't ever took notes. Now, like as I'm like reading, I'm like, I'll take notes of stuff like that. I'm like, oh shit, they do do that. Yeah. But like being his first movie, like dude, he kind of lucked out. Like did not realize like what he stepped in. Oh yeah. Well, he turned it down originally he did. because he didn't. I think he didn't feel like it was anything worthwhile. I think he didn't want to play a bad guy. He that, didn't want to play that could be a, and a terrorist for a first part. But somebody convinced him that you don't realize how lucky you are to get a part like this in a Hollywood movie, mm-hmm. and just that alone is what sold him on it. Yeah, and he was a trooper throughout the movie. Like we said, like he he has a lot of charisma. He's the brains of the operation. But the worst thing of all is that he's cold. He oh, is yeah. cold in this movie. He is not afraid to pull the trigger or even leave one of his own guys behind. Well. Actually, he's not totally cold, though. You get this assumption that he is. But then, after he kills Takagi, now, Holly, John McClane's wife, she's in charge. And she goes and approaches him, and she even says, I have a couple requests. And he goes, what idiot put you in charge? And she goes, you did, when you murdered my boss. Now it's up to me. And then she said that we have a pregnant woman, and sitting on the concrete's not going to help her out, so... We need to put her in a room to lay her down. Mm -hmm. And he says, well, I'll bring you a sofa. And then she even says, well, I also would appreciate it if you'd let us go to to the bathroom in groups. Yes. And he he allows them to do that. So, yes, he's cold, but yet at the same time you're like, wow, he's actually, like, caring about the comfort of the hostages here, which is awkward. How about that? That same woman who was pregnant... She's seen again, she has that line saying, wow, that man looks really pissed. I didn't see a couch. I didn't see her laying on a couch. She was still sitting on the ground. I thought she was going to go to the office. We weren't going to see her again because she's seen throughout the beginning of the movie. But I never saw her in that office in that sofa. I'm like, did they actually do what they say they were going to do? It didn't seem like they did. She was still laying on the concrete with her back arched, talking to Holly Gennaro. Oh, I'm well, like, well, Alan Rickman said he was going to give you a couch, but he didn't really do it. <laughs> maybe he intended to give her the couch. Maybe but... <laughs> intended, but it never really fell through. Well, John McClane's killing all the guys, so yeah. they, nobody's going to wheel the couch out for And then 15 minutes later, he blows Ellis's head off. <laughs> <laughs> he had it coming. He really had it coming. I mean, yeah, Ellis was scared. He was trying to do the right thing, thinking, hey, we can get out of this if your husband just gives himself up because he was because he didn't know who hans is ellis is cocky he's full of himself yeah he's living the la lifestyle you Mm -hmm. know like we said he's doing cocaine he talked about doing million dollar businesses in the morning yeah he thought this was just like another day in the office for him and that was mistake number one he has no experience with terrorist negotiating at all so this guy was in way over his head and john mcclain's telling him you don't know who you're messing with these guys will kill you they will kill you i've seen them kill takagi actually i didn't pick up on this at first but you have the uh the camera imaging on john mcclain's vision when they're having that meeting between hans gruber and takagi and then the terrorists are around them in that one uh meeting room the camera starts panning over but all you see are hans's hands and the gun so he still never saw his face I always thought, like, did he actually see his face in this moment? But he didn't. That was, that's good direction because it leads up to the first interaction with John McClane not knowing what he actually looks like. He just saw a guy with a suit and a hand reaching out to the gun and shooting his head off. So that was really, really clever. I do but, remember there was some backstory to that. I think there was a stunt man who took the shot and it didn't look like him. Yeah. And I think the the editing didn't work or okay. something and they liked the way how they had to cut really fast because of alan rickman doing the wincing mm-hmm. and just showing the back of the head they said it just had that like more of an impact yeah. then and that's why they didn't show the front it's not too noticeable to the wincing i didn't really notice a whole lot but uh, people have pointed it out but it's there uh, speak i'm um, going back to the uh, the plan i can tell watching this movie again this plan took months to prepare 
because of how quick and fast the group operates. You got Theo and Carl going through the front door. They shoot the one guard and then the flashbangs and then the good squib effects of the one guy getting blown away by the <laughs> elevators. And then you have Tony, the electrician, going right down to the basement, cutting the building's power. And then you have the guys emerging out of the truck. This is happening so fast. This had to have been months of preparation because this whole takeover happens in a matter of minutes. Oh, easily. They, you could tell these guys were professionals. They had it down mm -hmm. pat. They knew exactly what they were going to do. It's almost and like even Alan Rickman says, when after John McClane kills, uh, what's um, Gutnoff's character's brother? Tony. Tony? Tony. After John McClane kills Tony, mm -hmm. uh, Gutnoff's character is all distraught. Like, oh, he killed my brother. I want blood. Mm -hmm. I want revenge. And Alan Rickman's like, just stick to the plan. Right. You've got to stick to the plan. Exactly. He's, he is goal-oriented with his plan, but Carl's more of like the emotional powder keg that's saying, hey, plans change. This guy is throwing a wrench in your plan right now, and what are we going to do about it? Because if he's killed one of our guys, who's to say he can't kill more? But Alan Rickman, sticking to his plan, because he's already had this thought out, he's thinking about the police, thinking about the FBI, knowing that they're eventually going to shut show up basically and they're going to provide that final piece in the puzzle to get what we want even if theo doesn't quite see the plan yet because he says i can break the code i can drill into the safe but then there's this electromagnetic seal on this lock that's out of my hands i have no control over that what do you have to stop that and then alan rickman just gives him a little smile and says trust me i know exactly what's going to happen i'm plan oriented i have a plan I know this is going to work. You just you just got to go along with my lead. <laughs> yeah, they got everything down pat. I mean, they really awesome. they even knew that they wanted the cops and the FBI to come. But that's what confuses me a little bit because who was going to call the cops, though? Because they yeah. had all the hostages there. If it wasn't for John McClane, which the cops weren't even going to show up. No, the fire alarm was tripped, but then... You know, well, he even gets on the radio and he uses the emergency line and they... He has that really funny line because the the one lady says, This channel is reserved for emergency calls only. No fucking shit, lady! Do I sound like I'm ordering a pizza? <laughs> that was like the biggest gut-busting laugh of the whole movie. Because, are you kidding me, lady? Like, come on, this guy... How, how do you serious. just get, how do you just get access to something like this? It, 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 clearly, oh. he's got a high tech radio. Yeah, it looks like it's something from a law enforcement or military something. He didn't just buy this at a Radio Shack. I mean, no. the guy he knew what he was doing. And then you see the good shot of Carl and the other terrorists like rocking the machine guns. They got the MP5, and Carl has the badass Steyr Aug. It's this badass Austrian made rifle oh, so cool <laughs> i mean john mctiernan he has a pin shot for guns in his horror movie not horror, his action movies like look at look at predator i mean these these guys have like the ar-15 assault rifles oh, yeah. jesse jesse the body ventura has a minigun i mean <laughs> come on i mean they got these really awesome submachine guns and rifles in this movie it's so cool <laughs> <laughs> like they're gonna shoot them up oh <laughs> man it's so good and then there's that really awesome rooftop shootout scene fine report me come the fuck down here and arrest me just send the police now something just something <laughs> uh, but and, and that's what gets the police though is it's john mcclain he yeah. ki he kills the guys and he sees uh what's his what's his name reginald vell johnson who plays sergeant al Powell. people yeah, probably yeah. recognize him more from carl winslow yeah <laughs> another cop oh you also recognize him as the cop in ghostbusters that yeah yeah uh, arrested the guys at the end of the mm -hmm. movie yeah yeah <laughs> so he's got a knack for playing cops now did you you said you saw like on the gas station symbols that it was 74 cents back then? yeah <laughs> it's 74 cents back in the 80s Dude, that was also 30 years ago so. i know it was 30 years ago <laughs> I'm still envious that it's 74 cents a gallon. <laughs> and this is L.A. we're talking about. True. Yeah. Now, when we get that shot of Carl Win um, I keep wanting to call him Carl <laughs> Winslow, Sergeant Al Powell. He's, he's holding the, the bag of Twinkies, whatever, from the, uh, from the gas station. And he's looking down, basically, the Century City Boulevard, looking at the Nakatomi Plaza. You see the lights flashing back and forth. At first, I thought that was the actual effects of the guns going back and forth. But the building had lights. So that wasn't the actual effects of the machine guns going back and forth. I, that's what I thought it was originally. It's just the building had lights flashing back and forth. Interesting thing about the building, 
when they were scouting locations, they wanted to look for a building that was tall enough, and here they found out it's a 20th Century Fox movie, and it was 20th Century Fox's corporate tower. It yeah. Was, it was literally actually across the street from where they were trying to figure out where to do this. Yeah. They literally looked out the window, and one guy's like, how about that building? <laughs> like, oh, we already own this. Yeah, how about the one we own? <laughs> and, that, and they were really under construction. They said, you guys can have these top floors that aren't finished yet, mm -hmm. which they utilized in the movie. And they had the couple bottom floors they used for the hostages scenes. And then the rest of the floors were actually used for lawyers and, I guess, other business people at mm -hmm. the time. And they had to film at 5 o'clock or film the action scenes at 5 o'clock and after because the lawyers complained about the gunshots going off. <laughs> oh, and on top of that, 20th Century Fox charged them rent. What? Uh, what? In their own building? In their own building. <laughs> that is some cruel shit right there. Which, no, that's some <laughs> bullshit right there. Which makes absolutely no sense. We're going to oh, charge Lord. you rent for money that we're giving you to make mon our money back? That doesn't make any sense. I, I, that's I, dumb. Yeah, I know. Oh, my God. I'm just I, trying to figure that out now. <laughs> I'm glad they actually put that line in the script where Joe Tataki basically says, it, the, the building will be finished. We'll just have some couple levels under construction. I'm glad they actually at least referenced that. <laughs> yeah, we know this is a building that's under construction, but it, it'll look good. It'll look good in a couple you know months from now, but... <laughs> They utilized everything in that movie. Like the chains, they said the chains were just hanging there, and they were like, well, let's use this for a fight scene. That, the one random cart? That is... cart that they used, they said, yeah, let's just throw a couple guys on and have it wheel off as they're fighting each other. Mm -hmm. They took the surroundings, which is like a very film school-like atmosphere. Yeah. It's like, hey, you see that? Oh, why don't we use it? Yeah, hey, why not? <laughs> That was really cool. Like the, the shot where Bruce Willis is going down the elevator shaft, and it's the stunt man. He's supposed to go from one part of the wall to the other. He slips and falls accidentally, and they said it was a total accident, but it was a great shot mm -hmm. that the editor said, well, get a shot of him holding on to a vent cover and have him look like he's going through a vent, and we can use that. And then mm -hmm. that's when Bruce Willis crawls into the vent and has the... <laughs> the scene with the lighter and he goes come out to the coast have a few laughs it'll be great <laughs> that, that wasn't like supposed to be in the movie <laughs> just... now i know what a tv dinner feels like <laughs> that, that, honestly it's probably like one of the most iconic scenes you see from this movie mm -hmm. is him in the vent and just like it's such a tight shot and then like it, it's actually pretty funny again it's another one of those quotable lines i mean the most quotable from die hard obviously is you be motherfucker, motherfucker. But there's the, you know, come out to the coast, and there's the, now I know what a TV dinner feels like. Welcome to the party, pal. Yeah. Welcome to the party, pal, which is what finally gets the cops going, and the FBI comes in, and now everything is elevated to 10. Yeah. yeah. I think the funniest scene about the whole, when, uh, I want to call him Winslow now. <laughs> I want to call him Winslow. <laughs> when Powell shows up, and he's looking around the parking lot, and he goes... Uh, who's driving the car? Stevie Wonder? I know. Yeah. But the funny thing is, when Argyle's in the basement, and they show the shot after that, he's actually listening to the song Skeleton by Stevie Wonder. Oh, I shit. was like, you guys played that oh, off shit. so well. That's great. That's great. Oh, my God. I, then we do notice, like, the one glaring issue where John McClane is wearing a white tank top that's dirty, and then when he comes out of the vent, it's all of a sudden, like, completely brown. Like, yeah, it was a little bit of a wardrobe change. They probably, uh, that was probably, that was a little mistake. See, but for being a, a clean vent, like, I guess it really wasn't running. It should have been clean. It should have just been a little dirty, not straight fucking brown. Ba you, like, every I square inch everything. of white is brown, basically. Like, no, that wouldn't happen. It's not that filthy. I did like how he kills Marco. It kind of reminded me of, like, the one scene from The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, where it... You know, you have the one, um, I forget the character who's the ugly character. He's in the bathtub, shoots the guy. It's almost like that one moment where he says, if you're going to kill somebody, do it. Don't just stand there talking about it. Next time you get the chance to kill someone, don't hesitate. Boom, boom, boom. That's Thank the you. advice. <laughs> that kind of was like a little, it reminded me of a throwback to like the Clint, the Clint Eastwood Western movies. And then, of course, his body gets thrown out the window, hits Powell's car, then... The fucking M50 machine gun is blasting away the cop car, <laughs> unloading. And the fact that the dude backs over that embankment and it like crashes, and all he has afterwards is a little cut on his head. I'm like, I feel like there would have been a little more do damage done to him due to yeah. the fact that the, 
<laughs> the machine gun shooting at him the whole time. I doubt that windshield was bulletproof. <laughs> <laughs> As he's screaming over the radio, I need backup now, do it now! Then <laughs> <laughs> we are introduced to William Atherton's character, who's Dick Thornburg, the journalist who's just looking for a story. He has a, per- he has a police s- scanner, and then he picks up Al Powell's voice, and then he decides to steal a truck and goes down to this situation. Like, thank God he's not mentioned a lot in the movie. But seriously, we all know him as Walter Peck from Ghostbusters. We all know him from Walter Peck, yeah. <laughs> Is it true? What, he is dickless? <laughs> <laughs> yes, this man has no dick. <laughs> Dude, the guy had it, the market just for being a douchebag asshole, <laughs> and he had it perfect. His name was Dick in this movie, and he was a dick in Ghostbusters too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, the cops show up, and then, of course, Alan Rickman, he already knows this was going to happen. This is just a matter of inconvenient timing. Just, I have a, like I said, I have a plan. Stay calm. This guy is a problem. We're going to take care of him. And then, of course, we get that exchange between, oh, sorry, Hans, I didn't get that message. Maybe you should have put it up on the bulletin board. <laughs> Bruce Wells was so great at playing the smart-ass, badass. He's a character. lovable asshole that you just oh, yeah. you love to root for because he's a guy at the end who cares about people. He wants to do his duty as a cop. He, he acts like a cop in the movie, too. He even tells the one uh, terrorist, Marco, freeze, put that gun down. Like, don't shoot. Put the gun down right now. I'm a cop. And then, of course, uh, Heinrich ruins the day and he has to shoot him because he was going to kill him. There's the line when he holds up the first uh, terrorist. Tony. He says, you won't hurt me. You're a cop. And he goes... Well, what does that make a difference with? And he says, yeah. cops have rules. And he goes, that's funny, because that's what my... Chief keep, keeps telling me, bam! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know he's not afraid to push it, but yet, right. he, but yet he still tries to be a cop. He doesn't act above the law, really. Plus, he's out of his jurisdiction. This is which, true. Yeah. At this point, it doesn't matter what he does. This is very right. true, but he still tells a terrorist to freeze, put the gun down right now. So he's still trying to do the right thing. Right. Even with Ellis, he's trying to save his life, even though he's mm-hmm. a dick and the guy's hitting on his wife, and you can tell he doesn't like the guy, but he's still trying to tell him, look, you know, they're going to kill you. That sleazeball laugh. <laughs> oh, my God, that character. That really well, yeah, yeah I, I watch the movie a lot. <laughs> I, I can see. <laughs> hey, I'll admit, I've watched this movie at least twice in preparation for this show. I did, too. It, I and did then too. I had it on sporadically just because... It's that good. I Honestly. watched Die Hard 2 and Die Hard with a Vengeance. <laughs> over the past, what, let's say Thursday? I said over the past three days, I've been trying to watch this movie. I kid you not. I'd start it, something would happen, and it was making me mad because I'm like, I would literally just restart the movie <laughs> just because I'm like, I can't just watch it in pieces. This like, isn't Showgirls where you do chores in I between. Know. You want to watch the movie <laughs> yeah. from beginning to end. I was like, literally, I finished it up yesterday, and my wife's like, are you still watching Die Hard? I go, I go, probably for the third time. <laughs> Die Hard is one of those movies where if somebody says they never saw it, you grab them aggressively and you say, you sit the fuck down, you watching it. This is in the top 1,001 movies you have to see before you die. yippee ki motherfucker, is in the top 100 of the 100 greatest movie line quotes. Yeah. Was that in the script or was that ad-libbed? I remember Bruce Willis and D'Souza. They were talking about the Westerns and what could have influenced them mm-hmm. or something. And they talked about how they both did actually enjoy Roy Rogers. I guess that's how it came about. And I gotcha. I don't know if he, they came up with something and put it in or if on the fly Willis just mm-hmm. came up with the line. But now it's, oh. it, it does feel like an ad lib. It does feel like an ad lib. Like, I, I actually wonder how much of the movie was improv but from what it sounded like there was quite a bit of the humor written in but because mm-hmm. of how good willis is as being a smart ass mm-hmm. I, I just think he came up with some like a bunch of stuff on his own say, dude that line became so iconic it's actually in every single diehard movie so it's like everyone knows where it came from they know what it is it's like right. this is from diehard it's synonymous oh yeah oh, it's like arnold and doing i'll be back in every oh. Of course, every Terminator it, it, movie, yeah. Well, not just Terminator, him. but, like, on, every movie. Even the Expendables, Expendables, yeah. I'll be back. No, you've been back enough! <laughs> Bruce Willis. Just just lampooning everything. Oh, man, that's good stuff. There's one scene that I, I really love, and that's uh, it actually involves Ellis, and it's when he's trying to negotiate with Hans Gruber. He's, he's, he's basically, he thinks he's doing the right thing by trying to have John McClane give himself up so that everybody else can get out of here alive. 
so that no one else has to die. Not just one guy, Takagi, but everybody else gets to live. There's a really great shot construction that's being done. You have Ellis on the right-hand side of the camera, and then you have Bruce Willis on the left side when it cuts the shots back and forth. John McTiernan filmed this as if they were in the same room, even though they are floors apart from each other. Mm. Oh, wow. I think it's really cool how he set this up. Even though they are floors apart from each other, they're communicating via walkie-talkie, but the lighting is very dark with John McClane, and it's very lit up and illuminated with Ellis and Hans Gruber and the terrorists. It was really, really well set up, and that was actually part of John McTiernan's plan to have it seem like they were in the same room talking to one another, even though they were separated. That's really cool. It was cool. really, really cool directing, and how the lighting is, like you can just see like a luminescent of light on Bruce Willis's face and then you just have that dead silence where he doesn't want to say anything because he knows what's going to happen next John John dun, 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 dun. boom and then you just hear like the screaming of the hostages and then like Hans Gruber is pissed in this moment yeah he he's he's kept his cool but god damn it do not take his detonators away from him because <laughs> he will he will choke a bitch to get what he wants, and then I thought the line delivery was perfect for Bruce Willis just to say, go fuck yourself, Hans. I'm already tired. God damn you. <laughs> I mean, it really is a powerful moment of filmmaking, of writing, of acting, to have all these things culminate to one another. Um, and in other action movies, it's, it's kind of iconic that you have... Um, special effects in fact this movie was nominated for four oscars and i think they were all technical achievements one of them i think was special effects especially with that explosion where um john mcclain drops the c4 down the elevator shaft and it kills the two terrorists that have the um the rpg that blows up the rv <laughs> you know? but uh, i think that was one scene that was that was what basically got them the nomination because of how cool it looked actually the helicopter blowing the up. helicopter blowing up the roof exploding at the very end which was actually a model and they thought it wasn't gonna work yeah no it, it looked convincing it looked convincing to me <laughs> they also i think they slowed the the frames down then so give it that, like that slow motion kind of look mm -hmm. when the helicopter dropped and that really helped yeah. but they if you look at behind the scenes stuff the model that they used was huge. Okay. You know, this wasn't just like a basic kid's toy size model. Yeah. It was probably... Five maybe, foot, maybe? I think five foot tall, like maybe four, five feet across. It was massive. And, mm -hmm. like, the way they seamlessly put the helicopter, the real one, and yeah. then the model actually looked really well. Like, it does look really good. I thought it was, like, thought it was yeah. like, really happening. Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. I actually thought they blew up by a real helicopter mm -hmm. yeah I, that, I that's, so. so that's a credit to the to the special effects crew for that now there's one piece of like hollywood logic that i think was thrown out the door especially when it came to the c4 blowing up now i don't i'm not an explosives expert i do know that when it comes to c4 or semtex you need to have a blasting cap fitted on that device and it has to be detonated by radio it has to be some sort of detonator it has to be used it looked, he stuck a few pegs in the C4 and then wrapped it around a computer monitor and threw it down a shaft and it blew up. So it was like almost like the impact caused the explosion. Right, but even when you slap Semtex or C4, it doesn't go off. You can, you can run over with a car, you could shoot it, it will not go off. You need to have a detonator fixed to it in order for it to create the explosion. So there saying, was no detonator or no signal that was emitted to the C4 to have it blow up. So you're saying that without a detonator, you can actually have this stuff around your kids? Yeah, you could. No, no, we're not agreeing <laughs> to this. Oh, I'm making it say we're okay with you having. No, I'm not a terrorist. Yes. <laughs> FBI, don't knock down my door, please. I'm gonna leave right now. <laughs> but that's what I know. It needs to be fitted with a blasting cap, and you have to detonate it by radio or some sort of detonator in order for it to explode. It, you can't just slap it and it'll blow up. That's not how it works. Okay. But that's just that's just me talking. That Hollywood, of course, like. Shit. Well, it's there are nitpicky movie. parts. Like, yeah. like, why is Bruce Willis smoking while he's hiding? Because if they got guys running around looking for him... Okay. Yeah. <laughs> this is true. I don't know where he's at, but I can smell a cigarette. <laughs> One of our cigarettes. 
That's how he knows that they're European because of the way their clothing labels and their cigarettes. Mm -hmm. When he pulled those cigarettes out of Tony's bag and then he's looking at the body of Heinrich, ooh, these are very bad for you. And, and, he, <laughs> and he tells Pal about that. And that's how Pal, because yeah. he doesn't tell him who he really is. He doesn't tell him he's a cop. Right. He says to the, to the sergeant then, or whoever the other guy is, Dude from, the, of police, yeah, yeah. dude from the Breakfast Club. Yeah, guy from yeah, the, the principal from Breakfast Club. Yeah, when he talked, I never even put that correlation yeah, together. I'm like, <laughs> even if I'm watching the I'm watching the movie, I'm like Paul Gleason. Paul yeah, Gleason. Like, that's why does it look familiar? I'm like, ah, I just blew it off. I'm like typical '80s whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Breakfast Club, get the bubba. <laughs> oh, man. what he's telling him, he says, I think he's a cop because he's talking about forgeries and. Fake, fake IDs, IDs. Yeah. knowing the, the cigarettes are. He's like, so does a bartender. <laughs> he does have a, that's a, that's a good funny line. Jesus Christ, pal, I can be a fucking bartender for all we know. <laughs> Ironically, Bruce Willis used to be a bartender. Yeah. Well, did you ever see that music video he has where he is Listen, a bartender? We're not talking about Bruno. Let's not talk right? about his music career here. I know I brought it up before filming this because of, you know, listening to it, which is a bad choice. I'm sorry, Bruce Willis, don't murder me. But your music career kind of sucked, man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, 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 did, you did what you did back then to make money. <laughs> Just I, think, I think the last album was in the 90s. That's not back then. Yeah. <laughs> That's closer to now. <laughs> he had a cameo in Friends. <laughs> <laughs> he he was also cameo. in. <laughs> cameo in that 70s show? Yeah, yeah, he did. With uh, Ashton Kutcher, who was with his ex-wife. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, Jesus. Much. <laughs> yeah, really awkward much. It does cut back and forth to the news segments, and here you get you get to learn a little bit about Hans because you really don't know a whole lot. However, I do think the exchange between Bruce Willis and Hans, you learn a little bit about him in terms of his gun experience. He said he spent a weekend at the combat ranch, you know, like shooting guns with red paint. I don't think he was lying about that. I think that's actually something that he did. That was one of his few experiences with firearms. Because if you take notice, all the shots he take are within close range. Like you yes. really can't miss. Yeah. And then, of course, the news anchor says that he belonged to the radical West German Volksfrei movement, and then he was expelled from that organization. And so he probably planned this months ago, and even though he knew he was going to be released from this radical, like, faction in Germany, and here he is now. So everyone's wondering, well, what happened to this guy? We didn't really keep close tabs on him, and now he's holding a building hostage. Yeah, you get just enough to know that this guy is not one to mess with. And as the story escalates, we find out that he's really not there to harm people. He just really wants to get the money and leave. Right. E even towards the end of the movie, after he sends all the hostages up to the roof, and John McClane calls him out and says, Yo, they're going to blow up the building. Everybody, you got to get off. You got to get off. And the FBI shooting at him because he shoot McClane shooting his gun, trying to get the hostages back off the roof. Yeah. Well, if you look at that situation, it's like literally... You just seen a dude shooting. Oh, he's a bad guy. Oh like, yeah, they're in a helicopter. It makes helicopter. sense for them to do that, of course. And it le and that's what leads up to him tying the fire hose to his waist, jumping off the building, getting the cool explosion shot, the money shot. And then the fact that like when he does jump down, he starts shooting the window to break it because he can't then, kick it. <laughs> yeah, it's like, dude, it's it's a high up window. It's supposed to take impact. It's supposed to do wind. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, like, he thinks he's safe, and that piece of the fire hose comes over the edge of the roof, mm. and it starts pulling him down. I'm like, really? That was the one part I'm sitting there, I'm like, they even thought about it, like, the whole physics behind it. Yeah, that's going to be heavier than you. And he's already beaten and tired. I mean, he's in battle damage mode at this point. He's got blood all over, it's glass even, in his yeah. feet. At that point, he's already been through the broken glass scene, which we have mentioned earlier, which is probably one of the most badass scenes. Is when Hans is trying to get his detonators back. And they kind of pin him down in an office. And they're shooting, and all of a sudden, uh, he realizes this, after, this is already after Hans and John met, and he's not wearing shoes. He's telling his buddy Carl to shoot the window, or shoot the glass. And he's like, what? Shoot the glass! <laughs> and then now we have to deal with barefoot on broken glass. That is a really awesome scene, especially, I like to mention, I already mentioned this before with the squib effects. My dad and I, when we first watched that one guy get his kneecaps blown off and then he oh, flies right through, yeah. the, right through the glass, my dad was like, oh! He turned into like a wrestling announcer at one point. Oh my God! And his name is John Cena! <laughs> <laughs> and like, for that scene, he was almost barefoot. He actually just had rubber soles on his feet just yeah. so that he could run through. a whole foot. Yeah. 
And I just thought it was cool. Like, he looked barefoot, and mm-hmm. it made sure to make it look like this that. It looked like he legit got his legs blown off, and then he's just head hit full impact into the glass. Yeah, he's dead. <laughs> he's going to bleed out from that injury. He might have survived. Who knows? We yeah. need another sequel. You know, Die yeah, Hard right. 6 is Die Hard 6. <laughs> the one thing about the glass, though, that I call bullshit on... Okay. Is it looks like he pulls one piece of glass out of his foot. And it's massive, though. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, how it's, are you walking? It's like this big. Mm-hmm. But the glass that he was walking on, well, running on, dude, they, they'd be all over both feet. <laughs> I'm surprised he was able to get out from the flashbang because the one security guard got blown away from the flashbang, and he didn't know Carl had flashbangs. That's usually a dead giveaway. When you see this thing, it goes off. You're blinded. Listen. It's Bruce fucking Willis. It's Bruce fucking Willis. And then he just houdini his way out of there. <laughs> well, yeah, because he's Bruce fucking Willis. <laughs> it's okay. Smile, Carl. We're back in business. <laughs> <laughs> and he's pissed. Like I said, Hans Gruber is the brains. Carl is acting on pure emotion and rage right now. So when it comes to their big fight at the very end, they even says that line, we're both professional. This is personal. And then he just had, like, that big drag-out street fight. And Bruce Willis will it do whatever awesome. it takes. He will throw as many punches as he can. He doesn't know how to fight. Carl sort of does. It looked like he was throwing a couple, like, karate chops here and there. Kicks well, here and there. in all reality, the guy that played Carl was a ballerina, not an action star. So that's it, it kind of does. That's why you got that really high kick in the beginning. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I can see that now. <laughs> I can see that. makes sense now. <laughs> he'll get a big, punch to the face and, like, not even flinch. Yeah, he's a big dude. So it's he like... Is. And, and just, like, Willis is just the fucking ultimate badass, you know, just bloody, beaten, tired, and he's taking the hits, and he's giving them back. He's, like, throwing those fucking haymakers, like, like nine in a row. Just it's amazing. Even talking shit to the guy. Like, you should have hurt your brother or I broke his fucking neck. It's squeal. <laughs> it's squeal. It's oh so badass. It's like, yeah, you're just rooting for him. You're like, dude. Beat the shit out of this fucking crowd. It's so enthralling because in these action movies, you have to have a moment where there's a huge amount of vulnerability with your hero, where it looks like he could die, where it looks like he might actually lose. Where some of these other diehard ripoffs of these imitators, they don't, they lose, they lose that, that factor because it looks like the action star is on top of it the whole time. Like, look, I already mentioned Under Siege before. It looked like Steven Seagal was in, tro- in control of that whole movie the entire time where there wasn't really maybe a hint of a moment where it looked like he was going to die. But he's taking out everyone with his pinky finger. Like, that's not relatable. Listen, look at this guy. He's getting beat up, and he's about to, on the verge of death, and he comes out on top, and it's so enthralling when he takes down Carl. Listen, you forgot it. Steven Seagal, he's cock puncher, so that's all we have to worry about. <laughs> But, like, that the whole scene with Carl. He's a like, cock puncher. I know. You call I'm him like, a cock puncher. Dude, watch most of those movies. He punches somebody in the cock, all right? I don't care who you are. I've seen enough. First move, cock punch. That's it. You're going to distract in the... <laughs> Steven Seagal in cock puncher. <laughs> Two. <laughs> He'll film it in Russia. That's where he is right now, living as a citizen. But that whole fight between him and Carl, like, it it almost, like, was on borderline drug out, but it, I think felt like it needed to be because, like, obviously, John McClane's a smaller dude, Carl's a bigger guy, and, like, yeah, it's gonna, he's gonna have to try everything he can, like, that's where we got the whole, hit him riding the cart, and he's punching the shit out of his face, mm-hmm. and I was like, even the end where he wraps the chain and, like, kicks him, Yeah. but oh, I found man, this out, like, it. even when you're watching the the scene, you already know Carl's still alive. Because you if you look over here, like, the shots over uh, John McClane's shoulder, you can see Carl actually looking at him. So, like, you already know ahead of time that at the end he's going to pop back up. And I'm like, oh, shit, when I found that out, I looked for it. And, like, yeah. I was like, I never noticed that. Like, I'm like, they've thought about even the small details of what actually is going to happen ahead of time. I was, yeah, nice. I was like, and honestly, like, out of all the terrorists, bank robbers, whatever the fuck they are, I think Carl was probably the most menacing looking and most badass. It made like, sense. Oh, yeah. It like, dude, he was sense. a scary dude. Oh, really? He is. But, God rest that actor's soul. The name is Alexander Gudinoff. He, the only movie I really know him before Die Hard was Witness, yeah. where he was a, a member of the uh, Amish community in Lancaster, PA, which was shot in Lancaster, Wait, PA. Wait, is that the movie with Harrison Ford? Yes, yeah. it is. All right. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah, he was in that movie, too. Brilliant actor. It's a shame that he went so early in his career. I think he was only 45 when he passed oh, away. Wow. Yeah, he was very, he was young. 
And there's so much chaos. It's not just the fight scene between Carl and McLean. It's also like the, the choppers on their way to basically the FBI is conducting their plan to basically kill the, host, the, the terrorists. And, you know, even these guys, they have no problem if they lose 20, 25% of the hostages. That's kind Which of a bullshit. really scumbag you thing to like think about. And, and you want to save everybody. That should be your ultimate goal. And one of the Johnson FBI guys is Robert Davi. Robert Davi from our favorite movie, Showgirls. <laughs> he's a good he's a good actor. Yeah, he, he really totally is. is a good actor. I mean, yeah. he played that smug FBI guy down to a T, and then he's just like having fun in the chopper, like mm-hmm. reminiscing about how it was similar to Saigon. And... <laughs> I was in junior high, dickhead. <laughs> this is the age difference that we have. <laughs> it's like being in the FBI has that ultimate get out of jail free card, and yeah. he just played it off so well. And like Powell says, they're running through the Universal Terrorist playbook because it's the FBI. They've, they've seen situations like this before, so this is how we're going to do it. But this is not your conventional group of terrorists because they want you to shut the power down. And then the safe opens. You have Beethoven's Ode to Joy yeah. being played in the background. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Yes, Merry Christmas is mul- mentioned multiple times in this movie. We'll get to that later. Honestly, that was probably like one of the coolest segments where the music kicks in and then like all the, the sparks, everything. Like it was a magical scene, and then you discover it's money that's in there. I bet they're pissing their pants right now. Yeah, with joy. <laughs> they're rich. And it's after that, Hans is starting to load up and saying, "Hey, we got to get out of here." Um, the roof has exploded. The helicopters crashed at this point. Mm-hmm. John McClane just beat the shit out of Carl, and now he's trying to find a way to get Holly back. Right. And, and Holly wouldn't be in this situation if it wasn't for Dick Thornburger who had to go to the house and interview yes, the kids. We forgot to mention that. And then all of a what sudden a he just he just <laughs> looks at Holly's face, Hans Gruber, and then realizes, wait a minute, do you know those children? This picture's down. Mrs. McClane. I thought something was up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Funny thing about the actress, um, I can't remember that. Bonnie, Bonnie Bedel- Bedel- Bedelia. Yeah, I can't even say her name, but yeah, like Bruce Willis was the one that actually wanted her to play his estranged wife after seeing her in was it Heart Like a Wheel in 1983? Yeah, and he's like, after seeing that, he's like, I want her to play. I'm like, well, it's kind of an odd thing to think when you're watching a movie, but like, I want her to play my estranged wife. Like, <laughs> yeah. But oh. she's great. Oh my she's god, very I, you good. know, like what I've was... only seen her in a couple other things. I think Diamond one too. Die Hard 2. Die Hard 2? She was in a movie with Harrison Ford and Raul Julia called um, Pre- Presumed Innocent, I think. That sounds she, good. she played Harrison Ford's wife. Okay. okay. And she was great in that. I think she's done a lot more TV, but, I mean, she, everything that I've seen her in, she's just nailed it, man. She's awesome. So mm-hmm. I, I'm fucking glad he got her to honestly yeah. she did an amazing job like, Hell yeah. even by herself like not mm-hmm. knowing anything was good like how to handle everything but it showed that she was able to handle herself for being like a second in command mm-hmm. like obviously she knew her shit she so, wasn't a damsel in distress no. either and that was the no, badass no, thing wasn't. about that she's a she's a cop's wife you know mm-hmm. she she knows the the people that uh john mcclain's work with in new york she knows about the commanders. she's she's probably heard all the stories that her husband has told her, I'm sure, in New York. So she's, you know, of course, I don't think terrorists is something that she's familiar with, but she's seen a lot of, uh, or heard about a lot of some rough shit from her husband, so. She's the only one in that group that keeps her cool. She's tough. She's actually the one who even suggested Takagi, like, don't give yourself up to them. Tell us about her character. Which is kind of funny, like, when they're looking for Takagi, it... He looks at every stereotypical Asian person in the room. He even looks laughing. at Ellis, and Ellis is like, that's not me, man. And I was just laughing because I'm like, I took notes that, like, the older Asian gentlemen, they're like, mm-hmm. well, you? How about you? How about you? And then Takagi's like, listen, it's me. All right? Yeah. yeah. But it's terrifying because he's listing out every fact about Takagi. We're getting the character development as well as the necessary dialogue to progress the plot along. It goes back to that profession that they have where they just planned it all out. Yeah, they've been doing it for such a long time, like, planning this whole event to do. And, like, oh, yeah, I know you have kids. I know you're married, blah, blah. I'm like, damn, they they did their I know where where you went to school. I know where you interned. I know where you worked after you went to school. I can talk about men's fashion and industrialization all day. (laughs) (laughs) I'm smart. Don't mess with me. They even knew to get that that ambulance to come in to make it look like that's Mm -hmm. how they were going to escape. That's how they were going to get their bodies out of there because when they touch down, we blow the roof. And when everyone thinks that we went wrong, 
We'll be sitting on a beach earning 20%. This is my plan. I know it was smart, but it's like, in all reality, like, yeah. could really somebody pull that off? Like, sorry, FBI, but this is not your usual group of terrorists that I'm sure you've been accustomed to dealing with. Yeah. These guys are different. Like I said, they're not terrorists. <laughs> Who said we were terrorists? And Holly calls him out on that. She says, after all this, you're just a common thief. And yeah. that sets Alan Rickman oh, off. Oh, man, gets in her face. And, 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 and that was funny as hell, too. <laughs> I forget how exactly the line goes. I'm an exceptional thief, Mrs. McLean, and since I'm moving up to kidnapping, you should be more polite. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> John McLean, he's starting to make his way down to that lower level. Well, lower level. Lower it's, still, level. it's still high up in the yeah. building. Hey, it's on what, the thirtieth floor. Yeah. The way yeah. they made it seem in the movie it was the basement. It did look like the. And basement. then they're like, right. "Oh yeah, we're on the still on the thirtieth floor." I'm like. What? Yeah. Because yeah. he got that water fountain. Yeah. It looks like a lobby, like a step up from the lobby. That it's great like, shot of like, him coming like, out of the water, out of the waterfall in the fountain, and then just looking cool. at all the wreckage. The reason him. they did that is because of Predator and the waterfall that oh. Arnold falls down. I was like, wait a second here. <laughs> I ended up looking that up. I'm like, that's why they shot it like that. Because like, oh yeah, I did Predator. We have the waterfall here. Let's do something similar. <laughs> yeah. It's John McTiernan's signature. So oh, so he gets out of the water. He sees Holly and the uh, Huey Lewis looking guy. <laughs> <laughs> I think his name is Eddie. 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 He was the security guard down. It was, it was probably Huey Lewis. Dude, probably Dude, when Lewis. I first saw him get out of the truck, I swear to God, it looked right like Huey Lewis, and I was like, "Is that who I think it is?" That's the power of love. <laughs> It's like, damn, man. <laughs> That's a great shot of them coming out of the truck and then, like, Hans is in the middle of that group. That's mm -hmm. a good intro. All these all these villains have to have a badass intro. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just him and Hans and Holly, and that's when John takes out his um, his Beretta, and he sees he's only got two bullets left. Yep. He's like, oh, fuck. And he's been, like, shot in the shoulder now, so he knows he can't st stand a chance against these yeah. guys. I'm out of ammunition with my submachine gun. All he sees is the... The packing, the, packing the packing tape. And when I first saw that, I'm like, what is he going to do with packing tape? Yo, probably one of the most iconic scenes, too. Fucking yeah. taping it to his back so he can grab it while he... Put his hands on his head, head. yeah. yeah. I was it's like, like, how smart was that? It, really I was, was. Dude, it was a fantastic shot. Like, even, like, when they were panning back to show it over, like, what he did with it, I was yeah. like, oh, that's a nice angle, like, perfect, mm -hmm. and, I love the shot of him going down the hallway with the sparks, the sparks flying on his body. He is just dirty, bloodied, beaten up. Hi, honey. It oh, almost that looked was like so good. it looked and like a she... phoenix out of the fire, uh -huh. basically. <laughs> and even when he goes, "Hi, honey," she sees him and she's like, "Jesus, <laughs> I've oh. seen you on a rough day at the job, but this is another level. <laughs> <laughs> this goes beyond next." <laughs> yeah. One can steal $600 and expect to just disappear, but if you steal $600 million, they will find you unless they think you're already dead. Put down the gun. So he, he throws the machine gun, puts his hands behind the head. You got me. <laughs> shoots Huey, Huey Lewis and then shoots Han. Well, he shoots Han's well, first well, and well, then Huey Lewis. Right. I, was thinking, I was thinking Huey Lewis right away because, like, it's Huey Lewis. I'm like, Huey Lewis got it worse. He got it in the forehead. <laughs> They, there was they, a weird ADR moment where, like, it looked like Hans Gruber said something like, "And it is my," and then it just cuts him. It didn't look like he said anything. Well, Bill, we, before he, they shoot Hans and Huey Lewis, <laughs> we're just gonna call him Huey Lewis. He looks I like him. Um, they have that. They have that really good talk. Like, these are your last words, John. Mm -hmm. And he says, "Well, the, unfortunately." Was it John Wayne's not going to ride off in the sunset with Grace Kelly? And he goes, it was Gary Cooper, asshole. <laughs> and and he's like, That's, like stop. Yeah. You lost. I have your wife. Mm -hmm. Clearly, you can't do shit. So we got the guns on you. Yeah. Just forget it. I don't know. Killing nine out of yeah. 12 guys? <laughs> yeah. I think he did a lot. <laughs> oh, yeah, seriously. It's like a Western standoff at this moment yeah. right now. It really and they is. keep talking about Western movies this entire film. And he and Alan Rickman even says, "What was that line you said to me? Yippee ki yay, motherfucker!" <laughs> and they're just laughing then. Uh -huh. And Bruce Willis is just playing it off like, oh, "Yeah, you know what? I had a pretty good one on you." But oh, by the way, fuck you, Holly Duck. <laughs> shoot, gr shoots Hans in the shoulder, kills Huey Lewis. <laughs> and I think she had an idea of what was gonna happen because of the way he was laughing. Mm -hmm. And well, she knew something was something up. Something is up. And then that's when Hans falls backwards out the window 
and he has a hold of Holly yet, and mm-hmm. he's kind of got this like awkward hold where he's kind of like stuck on her Rolex that Ellis gave her. Yeah. That he was bragging, and he actually said at one point, "Yo, sh- show John the watch I got you," and he's like, "I'll see it later," and which is kind of funny how we it comes it back in the play <laughs> now. Yeah. And then that's when you get that really epic shot where John's going over and he's trying to help her get up. And that slow motion scene where you see Hans, he's just like turning his head and the gun's going slowly. Like, if I'm going down, you're going with me. And they just barely get the watch off her in time, which releases his hold and he falls to his death. Oh, I know. Oh, so. And so we got to talk about the fall from Alan Rick. It's brilliant. That epic look on his face. The sheer terror, the, like, oh, fuck. Yeah. Was real terror on his face. I know, yes, dude, finding that out was amazing. Because, like, they're like, all right, we're going to do a three count. They did it on two. And they mm-hmm. let him go. And I'm like. To get that authentic reaction. Because he, he thought he was going to get a shot off. And, nope, he's going down. <laughs> he was hoisted up about 40, was it 40 feet? Yeah. Or a little bigger. Feet. And they had the big you know blue screen air ballooned out and they told him and they said like he's never done a stunt before he (laughs) he already hurt his knee and and they said all right ready on the count of three we're gonna let you go and he's like i'm ready (laughs) (laughs) just like that and and they're going okay one two (laughs) like i can't help but think of it now every time i see it it's like We've all been in those situations where we're like, okay, we're all good. No shit! (laughs) I wonder if he was pissed after that. Do do, do you want about an adrenaline rush that must have been? (laughs) I really hate you guys. (laughs) Alan, I know you're mad, but it looks so good on film. I wonder if he actually said, could we actually do that again? (laughs) We're doing it on one this time. Ready? And three. And three. One, two, boom. Uh, so, the fire's dying down. The the all the the money or what like just like debris is falling from the building, and then you just have that scene where Bruce Willis is being escorted out by the firefighters, and they had this interaction between Powell and John McClane the whole time. They had that moment where they just look at each other. They don't have to say anything, but they know it's it's them. Other. They know that they're the ones that have been keeping each other calm and collected, and at least trying to provide some sort of levity and in a weird way they became friends throughout this whole they thing did. yeah you know it was kind of like Powell was a spiritual guide in a way mm-hmm. to keep him cool he even talked about how he shot a kid and that's what got him off the street because McLean even says something had to have gotten you off the street you know yeah. the way you talk it just feels like Something happened. Yeah, yeah. And and he, he's, he's hurt he's, by it. He's he, oh, he's, he he's very hurt by it and he has that, recovered. He had that good line where he says, "They can teach you everything, you know, from being a rookie, except how to handle making a mistake." Mm-hmm. And he said the kid had a laser gun. It was dark. I thought he was armed. And that's why he says he hasn't been able to draw his gun on anybody until the very end when he shoots Carl down. The character arc is complete. Oh yeah, <laughs> he has redemption. <laughs> Badass. It really was. Yeah, like we said, if there was one terrorist that was going to come out alive and try and get one shot off at McLean, it was going to be Carl. Still holding that stare og in that blanket. He is angry as fuck killing his brother. <laughs> fucking getting away how many times? I would have been angry after a while. Like, dude, this yeah. motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. Trying mm-hmm. to choke me out with a chain? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I know. Hang me, you son of a bitch. <laughs> I'm not dead yet. It was kind of like that 80s horror thing, that one last scare. Yeah, it was. like it the, was. the one last, oh shit. And John, at this point, he actually thinks, okay, I'm tired, I'm exhausted, we think it's all over, and it's like, I just gotta protect my wife at this point. Angry and German, come back! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dick Thornburg gets punched in the mouth for oh, exposing deserved, Holly to the media. It he deserved what it, too. What kind of fucking moron... Puts the kids on the news in a hostage situation, a live hostage situation. He just, he was looking out for his own reputation, yeah, trying to get a story. Jeez, man. Notoriety. His own self-interest. That's all he was doing for. <laughs> Argyle takes him out in the limousine. They drive off in the distance, and then we have, oh, the weather outside <laughs> is frightful. Well, 
ironically, yes, it is frightful out there right now. Yeah. There's a building <laughs> on fire. fire. <laughs> There's a building on fire. And, and California, uh, they caught wildfires in general. Yeah, they do. <laughs> the movie itself is amazing. Like, there might be, like, little nitpicky things that we could talk about, like yeah. the detonators and shit like that. <laughs> but the one thing I never took notice to was Bruce Willis is left-handed. Yeah. No, I noticed that. I didn't. And I'm like, I've watched this movie fucking hundred times. And, like, it wasn't until recently I started noticing, I'm like, dude, that, that was more badass to me because, like, there's not too many left-handed people no. out there. It's true. And I was like, me being one of them, like, made me, like, proud to finally see someone else, mm-hmm. even an action star, yeah. was one of them. Well, did you ever notice that he has this huge scar on his, um, like, the inside of his right shoulder? No, I didn't. In the movie? That's because he broke his arm and he had complications. And so they had this, they exposed the scar then a little more and showed, like, some badass. Oh, that's actually, that is badass. I do think there's no way in hell he would have been allowed to just go off in the limousine with Argyle and his wife. No, no. No, he's got... Questions to answer. He's got to be interrogated. He needs to go to the hospital to get his wounds patched up. There's no way that they would just let him go. They wanted to give him the happy ending, the Christmas music, they wanted everything. To, they that's, wanted to give the Christmas send off. That's yeah. that's the Hollywood send off right there. Because exactly. sure. who's gonna be like, oh shit, yeah, come with us, asshole. <laughs> yeah. Just like how it was so Hollywood that there was carpet in the bathroom. Dude, you were upset about that. Dude, no that is, more. come on. That is actually pretty disgusting. It I'm is not disgusting. Lie. No one, no one has that anymore. No, he's doing. Anymore. <laughs> he's doing the fists with the toes in the bathroom, and you can tell it's a bathroom. There are towels behind him. It looks like he's sitting on a toilet. The sink's in front of him, and it's like, wait, is that carpet in the bathroom? And in, in an executive, in an executive bathroom yet? You know how much piss is in that carpet yeah. now? All of it. All of it's in that carpet. Oh I don't care who you are. Any guy can piss in a toilet. It might make it, but there's always going to be that 2% that's on the floor. Was it a shag rug? Yeah, it looked like it. And he's making fists with his toes on the fucking In the piss rug, right? In the piss rug. (laughs) Boy, it's good he didn't step on glass at that point. Then he would have had more of an infection. Fuck, man. Jeez. Damn. Oh, my God. All right. That is uh, die hard. I'm going to admit, I do not have the least favorite scene. Um, yeah, you do. You just mentioned it. The fucking it's, drug. It's not a bad thing. It, it's, not, it's not a least favorite scene. It's a disturbing scene to me. Well, it would be your least favorite if you're fucking calling it disturbing now. But it's not like I have to, like, skip it. I just look at it and go, you know, this building's under construction. Who was the moron who did this? It's like, I, I would actually but, go back but, and say, yo, fix this while you assholes are still here. But you think about it. That was Fox's office. They already had that piss rug in there. Hey, and maybe that's why they sold it to Disney. <laughs> oh! <laughs> so wait, wait, wait. We're just saying that John McClane is now owned by Disney. How's that going to work out? I don't think it is. Yo, so we're he... going to get a PG-13 Die Hard 6? Die Hard, Die Hard 4 was PG-13. Yo, that was yo, one of the best was... installments. Yeah. Yo, what if John McClane becomes an Avenger? <laughs> <laughs> yo, Thanos. <laughs> Yippee-ki-yay, motherfucker. Who the fuck are you? Now, I will admit, Die Hard 4 had the, one of the best uses of yippee ki Because as Timothy Olyphant is holding him, stay oh, with me, right. pointing the gun into his oh, own oh, balloon yeah. shoulder. You're at the wrong place at the wrong time. That's what's going to say in your tombstone. I got an idea. How about yippee ki mother, boom! And then just blows him away. They don't say motherfucker, but it's one of the most badass moments in that whole movie. And it was PG-13 clean. Nice. Had a lot of hardcore, brutal action scenes for a PG-13 movie. And then Good Day to Die Hard was the day everyone died inside because it went back to rated R and was complete shit. Because they were trying to hand the story off. You can John Moore. Fuck that guy. I hate him even more now. And Skip Woods. (laughs) (laughs) That that strikes two and three right there. Let's not talk about that anymore. So you said you don't have a least favorite scene. (laughs) What What is your favorite scene? My favorite scene... I mean, one I I enjoy, of course, is, um, like, the main quotes. You know, they're always ones that I feel like you got to watch just because they are so quotable and it's got good action and it leads up to good shit. Even the Hans falling scene is good. But rewatching it again recently, I got to say my favorite scene that I and I think that is the most effective that doesn't get talked about is the one where he's taking the glass out of his foot and he's talking to Pal, and they're probably having the biggest heart-to-heart talk. And throughout the whole movie, he's nothing but, like, he's not in the Christmas spirit. He's mad at his wife. He's like, man, I gotta, like, help these people out. I don't want to. I don't know how. People are dying. He's getting his ass kicked. 
And then he actually has that moment of vulnerability where he says, I got a bad feeling out. I just want you to make sure that it's you who tells my wife. She's one of the greatest things that ever happened to me. I never said I'm sorry. We never properly worked it out. But if this is the end for me, let her know that I was sorry. And he's and he was going to go down swinging. And it's one of those scenes that it doesn't get talked about, but I felt like it was so crucial to the movie. I mean, even Jeb Stewart said it was the the heart of the movie was about him reconnecting with his ex-wife. Well, not ex-wife, but reconnecting with his wife. Estranged. Wife. Estranged. Wife, yeah. And, what, I mean, Bruce Willis is just so good of an actor. And, like, he, when he goes on the roller coaster of emotions to badass, smartass, miserable, and then heart-wrenching, it's like, yo, you really do feel for the guy. Oh, yeah. Because he's putting his life on the line for all these people, for his wife, and he's probably realizing not only will he not get that last chance with his wife to say he's sorry, but he'll never see his kids again if he dies. Yeah. And he'll never get to, to see them one last got time. two of them. Yeah. So, and then... He just does the most heroic thing, saves the day at the end. It's like, I felt like that scene itself was just so crucial. And he's doing it while he's fixing himself yet. He's fixing himself. He's letting Al talk to him, letting his stuff out. So they're like both bonding and mending. And it's one of those, we're all going to get through this. And that actually like is nice. They bring that back in the, the sequel that Al and him are still friends. They mm-hmm. still talk, which... Is nice. I'm glad. I wish he would have had bigger parts in the later movies because, like, I feel like I John McClane needed that almost outside help. Like, it almost was like grounding him. Like, yeah, everything's yeah. gonna be okay, no matter what. He goes through a roller coaster in those sequels. Like, he actually becomes an LA cop in Die Hard Two, and they're going to see Holly's family in DC. And then by Die Hard with a Vengeance, he's back to being a New York cop because he, we keep hearing about in the other sequels. Now he's in his own environment, but he is like rock bottom. He's on suspension. He's drunk all the time. And a demon from the past comes to resurgence and basically tries to kill him. I'd say even in uh, The Fear of Die Hard, he's still in New York. But ends up having to drop the dude off in DC. He goes through everything, and then he because the, everything how it ended in, in the first Die Hard movie, he moves to LA with Holly. Yeah. But then they had another argument and more complications, and then he moved back to New York and became a New York cop once again. So he's he's gone through everything. I know my favorite scene is the cat and mouse exchange, the the uh, the first face to face encounter with John McClane and Hans Gruber. That I think is the best scene because. You learn a little bit about each character, and they have like these, these tension relieving moments because they're laughing at each other's jokes, and they're just like, "I got invited to the Christmas party by mistake. Who knew?" <laughs> you know, and even how calm Hans Gruber is, even saying that his name is Clay, Bill Clay, because he saw the sign right behind him, he just assumed the identity of another office worker in there, and. Uh, John McClane never sees the face of Hans Gruber until that moment and that's this big cat and mouse exchange with the walkie talkie the whole time and then that even when Hans Gruber's got the gun point to his face he doesn't flinch he doesn't move even though he's no bullets in the gun like I know that gun's empty you think it's loaded and this back and forth exchange and then it goes into the most explosive action scene where there's just this machine gun firing back and forth shoot the glass like that whole window shattering explosion moment but that build up to it their first exchange that's my favorite moment in the whole movie because it was actually mostly improv i think i believe that scene was mostly improv there was some dialogue dialogue written in there least favorite scene i'll be on it like i said before it was the whole character of Dwayne t robinson like i just felt like he was useless through most of the movie like it's not Paul Gleason's fault because that was his character was written, but the jokes that he was given, especially with the FBI guys line, FBI. <laughs> I'm like, man, that was the worst. I don't care if you were like trying to not tell a joke in this moment, but it comes off as a joke that's not really funny because people just died in that scene, and I'm like, uh, just that, that could have been eliminated. I don't like that. 
And of course, you know, we've already hinted that there's a couple moments of ADR and then there's some wardrobe switches here and there, but the movie itself is incredibly iconic. Its rewatchability is staggering. You could watch this movie at any point in the movie, throughout the beginning, middle, and doesn't matter. And uh, I think you got to watch it more... I would prefer to watch it from the beginning. Because that's one gripe I do have with the movie, because you see so many ducks and elevator shafts and this construction here you can almost get lost and like didn't we just see him running through there mm-hmm. but he uses that <laughs> playboy uh yeah that's poster true. as a reference point. so reference, like yeah. what the second time you see it he po- mm-hmm. uh, touches it so it's like all right if you see him touch it it's the second time he's running through here yeah so that's but, true yeah. but not every part had a marking either yeah. and of course when people are going to pinpoint the very ending that's very hollywood eyes driving off the limit with the sunset when he should be going to the hospital getting patched up or and interrogated or <laughs> but yeah like he has a lot to answer for that that's you know some most people aren't going to give a shit because they just watched an incredibly awesome action movie that had a relatable hero with good writing good special effects and some really intense action sequences and good character development that gives good arcs to almost everybody. And like I said, yeah, the Dwayne T. Robinson character didn't really work for me most of the time, but that's all I really have to say. Jeff? Actually, my scene does not include John McClane at all. Ooh. Ooh. My favorite scene is actually right after the whole gunfire and breaking the glass and when Hans makes Carl leave, and he goes downstairs, and he's super pissy, smashing shit. And then the pregnant woman and Holly are sitting there, and the pregnant woman's like, that guy is super pissy. And Holly knows at that point, John's still alive, and she goes, there's only one person that can make anybody that pissed off. I'm like, yo, this scene right here shows <laughs> so much. I know from experience. Yeah, it's like, I was like, because like, rewatching, I'm like, looking, I'm looking for a specific scene, and I'm like, they're all amazing, but like that one's the one that stuck out for me, because like, at that moment, she now knows her husband's still alive. And I'm like, yo, that's an amazing scene. Just, And it shows how much uh, John McClane was under Carl's skin. Like, he wanted to fucking kill him. And I was like, and then we get the exchange later where we're professionals, for, but this is personal. That is where, like, that was the culmination of that part right there. And I'm like, yo, this is perfect. Yeah. It just, That one just stuck out to me, but... Honestly, I don't have a least favorite scene. Like, there's nothing to complain about. Like, obviously, the ending is funny as hell, but (laughs) there's, like, maybe little stupid shit, like bad jokes, but you really can't. You can't complain over a two-hour-long movie. You're going to have some... Everything else is so good that it outweighs the bad. I think even the score itself is really good. Like, the moments where it makes it more intense, like, even throwing in the Beethoven and stuff like that was perfect. Michael Kamen. Michael Kamen scored the movie. Yeah, good, comp- great composer. Actually, there was one thing I noticed when I watched this movie. There are so many comparisons to this movie and Lethal Weapon because they both take place in L.A. They both take place during Christmas time. They revolve around the LAPD. Al Jung plays a terrorist in both <laughs> movies. And one of the news anchors, Mary Ellen Trainer, who was pretty much everyone's mother in the 80s, she plays the one news anchor, and she's the LAPD shrink in Lethal Weapon. Oh, that's right. And both movies were scored by Michael Kamen. They just have different studios, Warner Brothers, 20th Century Fox. That's pretty much it. One's a buddy cop and one is more of like a, uh, a white knuckle one, one savior action movie, but there's a lot of comparisons to those two movies. So, Except it's Bruce fucking Willis. Yeah, it's Bruce, Bruce fucking, fucking Willis. Willis. So I'm, saying, I'm guessing you're taking the stance that this is a Christmas movie then. This has got to be a Christmas movie. Christmas is mentioned nine times in this movie. They let you not forget that this is Christmas time. They're at a Christmas party with Christmas trees and I don't know the amount of Christmas music that is being played throughout this fucking movie leads me to believe that it is a Christmas movie because like no matter what no matter how much actions in it no matter how much swearing no matter what it comes down to it's happening on Christmas fucking Eve yeah so yeah we don't see the fat guy in a red suit we have John motherfucking McClane yeah <laughs> and he ho, ho. Oh. I was like, dude, he puts a terrorist in a chair after killing him and writes, ho, 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 now I have a machine gun with a fucking Santa hat. Yeah. That is motherfucking Christmas right there. That yeah, is. Even some people, like, give me the checklist, like, for, like, does it fit these criteria of a Christmas movie? Is there a party? Yeah, there's an office Christmas party. Does it end with a kiss? Yeah. Actually, it does. Holly and John in the limousine. Yes, it does end with a quit, a kiss. 
is there a Christmas miracle? Yeah, that Christmas miracle is John McClane is the only savior of the Nakatomi hostages. John John's wife's name is Holly. Have a holly jolly. Oh, come on! Shit. Come on! I never made that correlation. <laughs> oh, ha- did I. <laughs> has the Christmas themes. It has giving, love, friendship. They're yeah. all in the movie. Um, and it's an evolution of a Christmas movie. It doesn't have to, like, Home Alone. Technically, like, a movie like Die Hard and Home Alone, you could have it take place during Halloween or Thanksgiving. It's going to be and, a horror movie, right? And, and still, <laughs> and, and, but, and still it's going to be a kid alone thwarting bank robbers or, or house robbers. Dude, motherfucking kid kicks their ass with paint cans, all right? Yeah. They're dead. Yeah. So, Micro machines. Yeah. But it takes place during Christmas, and you, get the, and you get the aesthetics, and that has the themes of Christmas in it. So, really, it's just a family comedy, but we watch it at Christmas, and we consider that a Christmas movie. So, therefore, Die Hard is an action genre movie, but it has the aesthetics in it, mm-hmm. and therefore, it's a, I mean... It, it's a Christmas movie, and the most important thing about it is, if you feel the need to watch it during Christmas because it gets you in the spirit, fuck right. Then it does its job. It doesn't matter what the genre is. You can watch Batman Returns because it has Christmas in it, mm-hmm. and that'll be a Christmas movie for so, you. Dude, Lethal Weapon. Lethal dude, Weapon. There's, a, there's a whole string of movies that there's are Christmas lot. movies, but yet they're portrayed as action films. Jaws the Revenge. No, we don't talk about <laughs> that. That's not an action film. <laughs> but we're going to say, like, the fact that it is a Christmas movie, they have a book called A Die Hard Christmas. So this ah, leads me to believe it is motherfucking beautiful. Christmas. That Dude, is a it is, beautiful book of I know, like, amazingness. I bought this for my daughter last year before she was born, and I was like, this is probably the best book I've ever bought in. Because it is, like, <laughs> amazingness. Twas the night before Christmas, and yeah. not a stir in the house. No one was stirring except the four assholes coming in through the south <laughs> rear, two-by-two two cover formation. <laughs> and it also oh. involves around, like, the classic Christmas stories about people learning a lesson. You know, John mm-hmm. McClane comes in feeling all, like, Ebenezer Scrooge, and I guess you compare the terrorists to the... The ghosts, <laughs> Christmas past, you know, or he's the Grinch. You know, yeah. he, well, I was thinking Hans Gruber is the Grinch. <laughs> Hans Gruber's the Grinch because like, he doesn't a, really learn a lesson. He yeah, just dies in the end. True. <laughs> but it, it, the the lesson is uh, it's it's better to to give than to take, <laughs> <laughs> and that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> also, another thing I'm going to mention about Die Hard is this is like the ultimate movie to watch with a woman women fucking love die hard no they love bruce willis well maybe that's love, just they it. love fawning over bruce willis yo Young guys bruce love willis. bruce willis but i have heard so many girls talk about how die hard's in like almost 90 percent of their favorite movies and i'm like well now i know what i'm watching <laughs> <laughs> i'll tell you this movie got me in the holiday spirit it really did it's the only christmas movie i've seen so far it's so quotable it's got you know great action the character is awesome yeah. it doesn't have to have like those like cheesy 80s lines like if it bleeds we can kill it, it doesn't have to have that like it just feels natural the, yeah, exactly it does feel natural it feels like a real smart ass that's messing with a terrorist which in, in a lot of ways is super fucking ballsy yeah. but when you're bruce fucking willis <laughs> <laughs> hey why not seriously and i'm like was it i think it was either last year or before during the bruce willis roast he came out and said it it's not a action movie. It's not a Christmas movie. It's a Bruce fucking Willis movie. And truthfully, that's what it comes down to. That's what it is. It's Bruce fucking Willis. Yeah. When you think of Die Hard, you think of Bruce Willis. Yeah, that's the first thing that comes to mind. Then Alan Rickman. Some... Then Alan Rickman. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. You're going to so go good. watch it again, aren't you? I'm going to watch it again. <laughs> I'm going to watch all four of them. Hell. I'm going to watch it again. I don't care. <laughs> Jeff, you know you're going to watch it. Again. Oh, yeah. I might actually watch when you guys leave. <laughs> <laughs> We've said everything, it feels like. Yeah. I think we could say more, but we said what we should. (laughs) We could go on and on. I I don't really know how anybody can debate that it really isn't a Christmas movie, but yet I can understand what they're saying. I mean, technically, it is an action movie with Christmas in it, and you could probably take the themes of it and put it in any movie, even without a holiday, and say that. But, like I said before, if the aesthetics and the feel give you that Christmas spirit and give you that feeling of the holiday season, that's what matters. You know, we watch movies and we get an emotional pull from them and the great ones, that's what they do. 
Like, you know, it changed their minds of Bruce Willis. He wasn't just a comedy guy from Moonlighting. He became an action star because of it. And we were with him throughout that whole movie. And we became inspired by him because <laughs> he's awesome. Funny thing is, I almost started watching Moonlighting because of this movie. Yeah. <laughs> well, that and Ninja Turtles when they mention it. Yeah. But, man. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's also one of these movies that for aspiring filmmakers that watch Die Hard see the pacing see how well written it is see how it cuts tension the action it, it is a really great movie to just put in and say you don't know what to watch watch die hard it changed the game for action movies going forward has a lot of great laughs fighting with you i mean especially this day and age because the divorce rates are so high that here's a guy ready to die but he admits you know she was the best thing that ever happened to me oh, and yeah and he's gonna die trying and just to say like look she may not believe that i said this but i'm actually saying it yeah. i just thought that was a really great theme and i think it's something that should be looked upon more in people and say yo if you can't salvage anything at least recognize what was great at one time yeah that was a really good message i thought so any of you guys have anything else to add to our uh, Die Hard episode. I'd say, honestly, we probably hit everything. I think we hit everything. I think other than the teddy bear that was used in the movie was reused in the Red October. Uh, yeah, it was. That was the only, yeah, I was like, that was the only other thing I, like, I just saw on my paperwork. Uh, I wish John McTiernan was directing more. If I will say one last thing, I wish he was still relevant in this time period. And I will say this right now. If he had directed The Predator, it would have been better than what Shane Black did last year. <laughs> wow. Yeah. He was free. You could have gotten him. He would have thrown that script out the door and probably would have made a better movie. <laughs> probably had Arnold back in it, too. Yeah, everybody wants Arnold back in those movies. Side note, don't watch The Predator. If you're listening out here, please don't watch it. You'll, you'll want two hours of your life back. The Predator. Not Predator. The Predator in 2018. Uh, yeah. <laughs> on that note. <laughs> yes. On that note, we shall sign off. This is, oh, oh, we still got to talk about the bet. Oh, yeah. Bet. yeah. So, for Halloween, we made a bet with our Showgirls episode. John actually started it. He said in the first week that Showgirls got uploaded to YouTube, he said, within a month, we are going to hit a 1,000 views. Jeff started the bet by saying... I will buy you fries and say something nice about Showgirls. Which I still can't even say something nice. It I'm wasn't trying. really that nice. Dude, I, I can't even say anything nice. About I've been trying to for now three fucking months. Yeah. And right now the video is at like 49,000 views and counting. Well, we should say in seven fucking days. It hit it a thousand. Hit. Yeah. And honestly, I am very happy that it hit it. It was surprising. I'm grateful that all you are listening i don't know why it's that episode yeah i don't, I don't know there's, why there's so many other great episodes i'm like that fucking one episode <laughs> I'm, I'm actually getting mad already i think people just wanted to see the nudity if we had actually nudity in the in probably the, that'd be funny yeah, so probably like fifty thousand people <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh we're just listening to three assholes on yeah, here <laughs> Fifty thousand people just wanted to chime in because they attend the showgirl parties that happen <laughs> We also got to say, Jeff got off easy. You did. I'm still not fucking saying something nice. I'm trying, but it's not happening. I dressed up like Nomi Malone. <laughs> We're Halloween. I didn't think it was going to happen within a month. I was actually going to be generous and give John a few leeway days. But I opened up my dumb ass mouth. <laughs> he raised the stakes. Yep. I said I would dress up as Lady Gaga. It's a good costume that you wore. Actually, Dude, that's amazing. <laughs> actually, I think your sunglasses are still here. <laughs> yeah, actually, my sunglasses are. <laughs> but yes, apparently I got nice comments on my legs. <laughs> and if you guys want to see them, I think they're on our Facebook, but I know they're on our personal Facebooks too, so. Yep. Yeah, and that's the are. other thing. Please you know, comment on the shows more. Tell us what you like, what you don't like. Tell us what you think that we should... Uh, do next that you might be interested in we love feedback give us questions and then we'll answer them on the next show if we can you know we're all interested in hearing what we can change what we can improve 
I mean, it's really up to you guys. We just enjoy doing this, and it's a lot of fun, but we also want to make it, you know, intellectual for you. Yeah. yeah. Literally, it started out as three assholes talking about movies, and we're like, well, we've got an idea. We did it in my basement, so we're actually, we've been enjoying it. We just want to have everyone enjoy the experience with us, so you guys tell us anything. And by you guys subscribing... Goes to a the, long way. Subscribing to the YouTube channel really helps us out. So, uh, liking our Facebook page, you can find us at Cinema Sanitarium Productions. We're on Twitter at Cinema, what is it, Cinema Sanitarium Prod. Yeah. Couldn't fit the whole thing on there, so I had to yeah, turn it down a little bit. I think out of three of us, I'm the only one who doesn't have Twitter. I'm like the old person that I am. <laughs> the old person. Yeah, individually. You and your Twitters. <laughs> individually, we're on Twitter facebook and instagram feel free to contact us individually if you guys like yeah. and i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna probably say now there's probably gonna be a smart ass answer if i get any <laughs> <laughs> yeah don't expect some things too seriously we let one person on um our exorcist episode in the comment section know how we felt about because uh. <laughs> <laughs> he was being an unnecessary asshole so we let him have it we did it's still up there if you want to read it it's really entertaining it's pretty funny <laughs> but let's end this session at the asylum right now this is Colin Peters John Rashatter and Jeff Manfred and we shall see you all when the next session hits Nicky Kaye motherfucker stay crazy y'all welcome to the party pal <laughs> uh, please somebody help me